Do you want me to play to the camera at all, or do you want me to play to you? Uh, me, it's fine. It's okay. Um, I mean, this, is, this isn't, like, going to go on PBS or anything. Yeah, so it's, just, it's more archival, and then I might, you know, right. make some some clips if I yeah. ever get a website together, which yeah. hopefully will happen. But Okay. Um, so, okay, so we were saying that, you know, the, the you're saying that you, you don't, you, you use the word compose rather than write because that yeah. because you're using a sort of aural and, and voice based yes. mechanism which is your body and for the rest of it I do all of the above okay I write longhand on paper I compose on the computer more process of revising I print out like most people I print out very frequently mm -hmm. scrawl over the printout stare at what the scrawling on the printout is create another fair draft either in my mind uh, or on an, uh, in the, on the computer yeah I remember my drafts dr1 sometimes dr0 I know it's not gonna last long <laughs> then okay I've gone up to dr87 I think in some things I've gone up to dr 104 uh, in the file name and so and, and you're and you're using word in this Microsoft Word, and, and when you're doing using these files, I tend to use. Um, uh, I always get mixed up. I think they call it Real Office for Mac and Neo Office for uh, Windows. Maybe it's the opposite. Oh, okay. But it is. But it's a, basically a word processor like Word. Okay. Okay. Um, There's also a neat one that I use for difficult things. I don't know why, why I don't use it for anything. I'm not, I can't remember. Called um, something like Nisus Writer. Hmm. I could look at it. Yeah. I've heard of one called Scrivener. No, this is, this is I think, the state of the art. I think this oh. is the one. And um, Yes, Nisus, N-I-S-U-S, Writer Pro. And it's terrific at all kinds of... Uh, Elaborate formatting and indexes and Nisus Pro. Nisus Pro. Yeah. So, and when did you start using that? A couple of years ago. But I'll juggle them. I'll okay. go through phases or for certain purposes. Duplex printing on a non-duplex printing printer. Uh, I know how to do it on Word, so I'll open up Word. Okay. So in a way, I use all of the above, but uh, I'm not loyal to, to any particular word software, software essentially. Yeah. So the, what I guess what drove the getting the Nisus was somebody tell you did somebody tell you about it and you just thought I probably did some web research. Okay. But there were things that I didn't like about the um, Neo Office page numbering and headers and footers mm. seemed clumsy to me. Okay. And um, None of these programs are super expensive anymore. It's yeah. a big investment. Yeah. The best one I've ever used uh, uh, was, it, it's like Betamax versus VHS. It was excellent, but it didn't have enough followers. Word Perfect. Maybe Word Perfect like was Word perfect. perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> and um, that doesn't always win the marketplace. No, it does not. So when when what Word Perfect was in the nineties, I think. Oh, I'm an early computer user, so okay. I probably used started using it in the mid eighties. Okay. You know, I wrote a computer. I know. Entertainment uh, in the early eighties. Mind Wheel, correct? Mind Wheel, yeah. yeah. I just read a new, very informative article about Mind Wheel. So, although. I'm kind of a paper tiger in technical things. I don't really mm -hmm. know a lot about computers. I've had to do with them, and I've used them for a long time. Since since the early 80s? I think it was 1980. Okay. They asked me to start Mindwheel, wow. and you can tell how prehistoric, how early that was, by the brand of the computer that they gave me to write it on. Yeah. They gave me a computer that was an Atari. <laughs> <laughs> Do you miss the Atari? No. I still okay. can remember that uh, monochrome yellow, black on yellow monitor yeah. uh, that weighed more than uh, anybody's big flat screen <laughs> TV. Yeah. It was immense. And um, for a long time, anything I wrote to be read on the screen, I wrote on the computer. Yeah. And things I wrote meant to be read off paper, I wrote on paper either with a pen or with the nicest machine I've ever owned, an IBM Selectric. And when did you own that? 
I had a Selectric in the 70s and the 80s. I often regret that I don't still own one. Yeah. It's just such an, it was like a BMW. It was such an excellent machine. Yeah. That golf ball. Uh-huh. And then they got the lift-off tape so you could lift, you could erase perfectly. Oh. Because the ink, it was so precise. Yeah. That they had a, a lift-off ribbon. And you went to that and backspaced, it lifted the ink off the page. And it was a solid machine. It just didn't what it was supposed to do so well. Yeah. Uh, obvious advantage. There are obvious reasons why electronic, why the computer took over. Right. But this IBM Selectric was a beautiful machine. That's good. That's. I have not thought of it as a beautiful machine before, but I, I think that's good to know. I, have you ever used it? I've one? never really used it, so I can't say. It was amazing. Yeah. That's now awesome. I now I kind of want to go and, and find one. <laughs> um, my typewriter experiences are have not been very uh, good. Well, a crappy typewriter is not yeah. any fun. And any ones now that I end up looking at or using are, are, are out of, you know, out of tune, essentially. Yeah. So... Um, so you are a Windows user primarily, but with no, I am. I used to be a Windows user. I'm primarily an iOS okay. Mac user now. You're, you're primarily an iOS Mac user, um, and that is then just a screen that's coming from the, the MacBook Pro. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, and I mean, one refined, maybe this is the kind of thing you're interested in. I used to go through the whole rigmarole of syncing between my desktop and my laptop. Yeah. And uh, I went through various generations of the best way to do that. Right. And now I'm not quite at the uh, totally cloud web system, but yeah. I realized that uh, with a nice uh, external monitor, external keyboard, external mouse, I can use the MacBook Pro as what we used to call the ICU. Right. And then when I'm tired of using it that way, I just have to remember to eject the backup and then unplug all that stuff. And then, you've got to and then I put it, go to the airplane with it. Yeah. And I'm not syncing it with anything. It's itself. Yeah. Do you have, uh, I mean, when you when you save your files, do you have like a Dropbox account or anything I do like have that? a Dropbox okay. account. Okay, so you do have some sort of backup in the cloud. I have a Dropbox account, and I have a two terabyte, uh, amazingly small little white brick that yeah. backs up automatically. Okay. Um, and have you been, how long have you been doing the backups procedures? For years. Yeah. And um, I'd like to vilify the company, it's a sort of a French name, that where the backup failed. Oh, really? The computer broke and the, uh, I can't vilify them, I forget what they're called. It's not anyway. Lacey, is it? No. It may have been a Lacey. <laughs> anyway, that can happen too. Yeah, that's, that. so, so what, what, ha what happens most there? Most stories, most stories about, oh, I lost my book on Yates, or oh, I lost all this. Yeah. It, uh, it's about 79% bullshit. <laughs> Most of us have given the manuscript to somebody or have an earlier draft somewhere else. Yeah. It's never pure loss. Right. Like most things in life, it's a matter of degree. Yes. That's true. So what, I mean, what, what, what was the loss there? I can't remember. Can't remember. It wasn't. I lost a bunch of data. And okay. I didn't lose anything that I couldn't recreate or find a different version of somewhere else. Okay. Um, let me look at this for a second. You've sort, you sort of went through, like, <laughs> in your first answer, many of these questions right here. Um, uh, so it seems like you've been you've been fairly adept at using a computer for most of the time. Have you sought out any any instruction, or has it just been something you've taught yourself? Uh, it's mostly something I taught myself. Uh, adept is a relative term compared to all the other writers and poets I know. Yeah. I guess I'm adept uh, <laughs> compared to any 15 year old. Yeah, I try hard. Well. But and I did, you know, that first encounter, I, I've always liked gadgets. Yeah. Uh, I never was good in school, but I always liked learning a certain kind of thing. Right. And uh, I guess I'm the type that tends not to like to read the instructions. 
I would rather figure it out. Yeah. If there's two great personalities types in the, in the world, I tend to be the type that says, if I can't figure it out, I don't want to do it. Right. I want to have to read instructions. And I did hang out with programmers when I wrote MindWheels. My yeah. introduction to the computer technology, I did hear a certain amount of jargon. Yeah. And uh, sometimes when technologies are in a primitive state, you learn more about them than when they're more perfected. Yeah. One At one time, to drive a car, you had to know something about cars. Right. <laughs> uh, people in, in the days of the term hi-fi, you had to know something about the process of mm-hmm. recorded music. And as they improve the car and they improve some people think they didn't improve recorded music there's yeah. less and less anybody needs to know yeah um, so how did so I, I, I'm reminded of a story about the like what was the, like the early like MSN messenger wars where did you read this with like the AOL and the MSN people were, were like yes. going back and forth like trying yes. to kind of copy each other's thing and then yes. the the people at AOL started programming in like the basic 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 level like that's called I think it was called operator processing or something, and it's yeah. like huge, huge, you know, huge amounts, ones and zeros, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so that that so sort of the like thing before assembly language. Yeah. No, I think that. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So you you, you are way up there. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that came about, though? How how the mind wheel came about? I mean, what? Where did, did it? Did it? Were you at a like a a, a location that would, the programmers were near, or did they contact you specifically? How did? I was sitting in my office at the University of California at Berkeley. Okay. I was very glad to be at Berkeley after the, uh, for me, kind of tedious Wellesley College where I taught. I found Wellesley wasn't like going to jail. Okay. But it was it was a little New England Women's College. Yeah. So I was very happy to be at Berkeley. Okay. And that euphoria lasted for weeks. And then Berkeley also came to seem very much like, how can I put this? An English department. Yeah. <laughs> and the phone rang. Uh-huh. And uh, it was somebody named Ihor Wolosenko. First person, last person I've known named Ihor. Yeah. Ihor Wolosenko from uh, Synapse Software. Okay. And he said, I'm uh, looking for a writer to work on a new kind of computer product. Uh, Are you um, familiar with uh, text adventures? I said, no. He said, are you familiar with computers? I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of a game called Zork? I said, no. he said, um, it's a, a text that appears on the screen, and you can go north or south or east or west. You can pick up objects. It's a form of narrative. And we have a very superior program where it can become more sophisticated than that. Uh, and we're interested in uh, serious literary writers who might write text for a game like that. Yeah. Uh, might you be interested? I said, yes. It was the first yes I had in the conversation. <laughs> and uh, Synapse was in El Cerrito, which is quite close to Berkeley. Yeah. And uh, I went out there, and it was uh, it was not an English department. <laughs> there were these weird guys with their shirts half tucked in. I later learned they lived on Big Macs and Van Houten bars. They slept in the daytime and worked at night. They didn't pay for their phone service. They had different ways they could uh, pirate phone service and had little machines that made uh, long distance tones. Um, the uh, words that were most forbidden I've seen to them were not uh, racial epithets or sexual terms or scatological terms. The forbidden words were words like nerd. And uh, I liked them. Uh, so we were talking about um, Mindwheel. Yes. And so you went over to meet uh, the programmers and you, and you yes. liked and them quite a I bit. Yes, I wrote up uh, three or four different plots. Mm-hmm. And uh, the most far out one, uh, modeled in a vague way on Dante on the Commedia, yeah. was uh, you have to get, you're, you're, you're on a mission to travel through these mines, four mines. Turns out that mines leave permanent uh, uh, 
elaborate footprints and records of themselves uh, in what we'll call the ether. I can't remember what I call it mm-hmm. in the um, e- e- the game itself. I always called it a game. That they always called it an electronic novel. And, oh. Uh, there was... Um, at the beginning, Dr. Virgil puts the electrodes in your head, and then you travel through the minds of uh, a kind of Shakespeare Dante figure, uh-huh. a kind of political rock figure, vaguely John Lennon like, a woman who's kind of an Einstein, she's a chess man, and a great dictator, kind of uh, Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini mind. And this was, you could choose your own adventure kind of thing? Or? No, you, it, it's more interactive. Okay. Called it. Okay. You need to solve problems. Oh right. Some of them right. involve poetry. Um, Did you come up with those poetry with the poetry problems? Yes, or I would adapt ones from uh, 16th century poetry. Yeah. Uh, there's one riddle you have to solve. You have to free a winged woman from a cage, and the uh, on the cage is the riddle. Uh, it comes from Sir Walter Raleigh's poem on the cards and dice, uh-huh. and it says, uh, A herald strange, the like was never born, whose very beard is flesh and mouth is horn. You have to solve that riddle. In the Raleigh poem, which isn't there, uh, it's about the cards and dice, and it says, The trump will be heard, and dead bones will jump, but will be rattled, and men will groan. And uh, four kings will be gathered and four queens. and uh, mm-hmm. So it sounds like a mystic prophecy. Yeah. But uh, it's the cards and dice. Okay. And then it says, and they do this until a herald calls. A herald strange. Mm-hmm. Like was never born. Whose very beard is flesh and mouth is horn. I can see your flunking this. I'm totally flunking this. <laughs> they play all night. Oh. I'm still flunking this. Something wakes them up in the morning. The rooster? Yeah. Oh, oh beard, yeah. His, his flesh, his beard, his horn. Yeah. The rooster is not born, he's hatched. That's good. I saw it when I was a kid. You weren't born, you were hatched. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you incorporated a lot of things into that. Yes. Um... Well, so so how I, you know, and, and I'm interested in kind of like how that physically happened too. I mean, did you write that out on your Selectrics and then send them the text? Selectric and they, didn't appear in it. I wrote it on the Atari. You wrote it on the Atari. Okay. As I said, for a good period, I was one of the few people in the country who was writing everything I was writing to read off a screen yeah. on a computer. Everything I was writing to read off paper on paper. Okay. And the Times asked me to review a book of prose by Philip Larkin. Mm-hmm. I was having a little trouble getting started with it. And I'd been writing in this very fluid bubble world with a computer. Yeah. But I couldn't get started on the Larkin. So I decided I'll experiment. I'll see if I can write the lead on the computer, on that monochrome, uh, because it's so much less real yeah. than a pen or than uh, the typewriter. <laughs> yeah. Wall. And I wound up writing a draft of the whole fucking review on the Atari. Yeah. I can't print it out. (laughs) There were dot matrix printers over there at Synapse. Yeah. But I like visiting Synapse anyway. And I did have, you may never have even seen one of these. I did have the five and a quarter inch floppies. Oh, yeah. That's why they're called floppies. Those things were flexible. Yeah. They were flexible. So, um, I'm not sure if email was much used at the time. I didn't email at the synapse. No, yeah. I drove over to El Cerrito, uh-huh. uh, to that office park where Synapse had its offices, right next to a little company named uh, Pixel. And um, I used my five and a quarter inch floppy to print out my book review and it dawned on me you're going to have to get a printer (laughs) in fact you're going to have to get a better computer Ah. so within I can't remember probably a few weeks I had a juky junky dot matrix printer Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, what we used to call a PC clone, IBM clone, uh, called 
called a Corona, I think. It was okay. made in Italy, oddly enough. Yeah. And uh, that was, so that was probably 1981 or 1980 or something. It was quite early. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, so you were already on your second computer by early 80s. First one I owned and the second one I was using. Okay. Second one you were using. Um, the, uh, <sighs> Think. So, so I mean, just going back then, the impetus for getting that first computer, was it from Synapse? Did they... They gave me the Atari. They gave you the Atari. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was trying to come... And then they would, when you were writing for them, you would take... Would it you, was all electronic. It's all electronic. The programmers would... They took their assembly language and they the, the program they invented, William Mataga. Yeah. Later, Kathy Mataga. Uh, William uh, invented this... A program called BTZ, Better Than Zork. Okay. And uh, they would just put it into BTZ. I remember William was the sort of over programmer, and uh, the personal one, I, my partner, was Steve Hales. It okay. says on the package of Mind Wheel, Mind Wheel, an electronic novel by Robert Pitsky, writer William Mataga, and Steve Hales, programmers. The package oh, is a hardcover book. Okay. And the product is the floppy. Right, right. And um, I remember my first conference with Steve. Uh, he said, uh, I want you to describe your world to me. And then we had these interesting philosophical discussions of uh, rooms mm -hmm. and space and scenes and time. And do you think of the scene happening in a room? Or do you think of the room happening in the scene? Yeah. And we, so, there were some interesting conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's sort of the first, well. And dialogue tables. Uh huh. You know, things like that. Early conversations about virtual space. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, and coming out of sort of narrative practice. Uh, so, you know, let me, let's, can we move back a little bit? I mean, like, before all this, like when you were in your early early writing career, um, which uh, would you say is like right around the time when you went to Stanford, when you sort of started writing? I mean, I you know I read some of the interviews and, yeah. and some of that. I, I I thought of myself as a writer when I was at Rutgers. Okay. As an undergraduate, you know, I was uh, I was sort of beaten at wannabe. Um, I was writing, I was writing poems, I was editor of the undergraduate literary magazine. Uh, oh, cool. So, no, I had a writing line. Okay. And so when you when you were starting off, I mean, what was what, what were your practices like? I mean, were you writing on, a, like, did you keep notebooks? Did you... I've never kept notes. Or okay. Notebook. I'm not a note maker. Yeah. Um, I would get an idea for a poem, I would write it. Uh, I remember my, for a while I shared an apartment with Alan Schuess. Mm -hmm. novelist uh, he does book reviews for NPR yeah Alan was a year ahead of me and Alan was a fiction writer and uh, I can remember hearing his typewriter going <laughs> <laughs> and I was sitting there maybe with a paper pen thinking trying out different phrases in my mind yeah and sort of ending that <laughs> yeah and so has it always, I mean, has it been since that time and throughout that kind of, you've always kind of felt it as a sort of voiced oral thing in your head before anything? I mean, like, I got more and more confident in it, but okay. yes, that always was, I felt that was my metier. Yeah. What I could do that I felt not everybody could do had to do with the sounds of sentences, like that thing we just watched on TV. Absolutely. Uh, the sounds of sentences, the way vowels and consonants work together, the way a short sentence relates to a long sentence. How did you come to how, how did you come to figure out that you were that you could do that better than other people? Probably in the course of college, but I can remember that as a kid I would try to tap out the rhythms of sentences with my fingers, uh -huh. and uh, I thought about things like voiced and unvoiced consonants before I knew the word for them. Yeah. Uh, thinking about the difference between the uh, the th in the and the th in fin. The, you use your voice box. Fin, you don't. I wasn't sure. It seemed like a bad habit in a way. 
Yeah. But I thought about the sense of words. Yeah. So it's not a surprise to me that I was good at it when I discovered there was an art based on such things. Mm-hmm. And I guess the question is then how, how you kind of develop... I mean, you had that sort of innate talent. Then how, I mean, what were the steps you took to develop that talent? Reading. Reading. I had great teachers. My freshman English teacher was Paul Fussell. And wow. he asked us to read... ABC of Reading by Ezra Pound. Uh, I read Yeats and Eliot and Ginsberg and Bishop. And I recognized the way the sounds of words were doing things in those writers. Mm -hmm. Uh, William Carlos Williams and William Butler Yeats and Emily Dickinson. I didn't I was less interested in the differences among them right. than the thing I saw going on in all of them. And I was interested by that thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a better way to, to get into that. Um, so I guess, I, you know, when when you started to kind of, you know, compose the poems and, and they became more important to not only... Well, I mean, important to you personally, but also important to, like, your career and, and moving forward. Like, how did you... What, what were the ways of you working on them? Were they always kind of appearing in your head? You'd write them down by hand and then type them up for other people? I mean, what were the... What was the process? Yeah, the ideas there? floating around in my head for a long time. Yeah. Certain sets of ideas, like... Humble things have histories. You know... What were the first things you ever saw made out of plastic in your own life? Mm -hmm. Cheap shit from Japan after the war. Uh, Toys, mostly. Plastic soldiers. Metal soldiers during the war, you couldn't get them. Yeah. Sawdust soldiers. So, I would think about those substances. All set. Everything's all set. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, this is just all trash. I'm just going to take this with me. You're taking my trash? No, it was all. <laughs> no, I don't want to leave it up there. So. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks a right. lot. You so long. You too. Um, those ideas, that set of ideas might be there, one about different materials, one about. Plant, then I would think the word plant. That's, that's all just thoughts. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, you know, I'd be mixing up my own personal history and time I left some sort of soldiers, pressed wood soldiers, out overnight and the dew made them blue and swelled up. Mm-hmm. And uh, completely other set of ideas might involve uh, war and the fascination of war and uh, I had an uncle who was in the Battle of the Bulge he was a radio man and I remember being very tiny and being fascinated by his massive boots just he's wearing the boots and I'm on the rug yeah. touching those big boots and uh, that's none of that's the poem Right. That's memories, thoughts, ideas. And then the poem is when you start putting some sounds together. Uh, something unnatural got the way a sword the soldier will swell in the rain, unlike the boots of my uncle. And you start moving the... This yeah. is a non-existent poem, by the way. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to give a little demo. Yeah. Uh, the poem starts when you start thinking about the vowels and consonants and uh, what's uncle to rearrange the consonants uh, yeah. unclean and uh, uh, calendar uh, and the calendar of childhood, the time between the day that you find out wooden soldiers get ruined and the day you that your mother and grandmother both dreamed that Julian was in trouble with Julian, uh, negligent, uh, negligent memories of unclean, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, that's, yes, that's the material. That's the material, yeah. And then, so how, I guess, you know, in the, 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 the purpose of, of these interviews is kind of to think about how that material becomes the book in, in all its iterations, yeah. you know, and how that, and how that has changed over the course of, 
you know, uh, you know, so how many computers do you think you've? I mean, like, in how many different writing yeah. devices and stuff like that. So, I mean, it, yeah, you, if you compose it in your head, I mean, will you have whole whole poems in your head before you write Sometimes, them down? But more often, I get enough enough lines to want to make a draft. Okay. So I'll write them down. Yeah. And uh, I'll look at, I'll recite to myself the different things I've written down, and then I'll decide, type it into a document that you can print out. Okay. And then I'll read that over and maybe get a new idea. And, and how, how was that? I mean, what was that like in the early, like in, the, like say, the early 70s, late 60s when you were working? Pre-computer. Yeah. Something that came out of a typewriter that has a lot of ballpoints all over it. Same, same sort of, you'd have Very a few similar. lines, you'd start to... Yeah, and now it comes out of um, a laser printer and it has felt pen all over it. Yeah. Um, what kind? What, and like when you're when you're actually doing the writing down, you don't. You say you don't usually use notebooks or anything. What what are you writing on? Is it just bare paper or? Yeah, my favorite kind of paper is very hard to get. Um, <clears throat> I'm forced to use this. Oh, because it's very hard to get this. <laughs> I don't like the lines. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. To get that, somehow society doesn't take this very seriously anymore. Yeah. You can get it white, but I don't want it white. You want it want yellow? yellow? I think that is the, the best uh, color-wise, yellow and black, or some sort of yellow yeah, as the yellow background. Yellow and black, the it's somehow a little more fluid than yeah. black and white. Yeah. So in black and white, it feels sort of... Uh, Legal or reductive. And have you been working with blank yellow paper, if you can, since early? Yes. We haven't talked much about prose. No. I can remember working on prose and going through lots and lots of different processes, uh, technologically. Mm -hmm. White out, of course. Yeah. But I can remember before the IBM liftoff, mm -hmm. I can remember using the... Uh, they even made it double space as well as single space, I believe, correction tape. Yeah. So you could um, you could take a passage that you wanted to change and you glue the tape down. And you might use a Xerox machine and you would do white out so the tape didn't leave uh, a telltale gray outline. Yeah. And I can remember uh, kind of thick palimpsest uh, pages where I had done that mm -hmm. on some piece of prose. And that would build up and build up until you got yeah, it. Yeah, I think, I think early drafts of the situation of poetry, Yeah, I was still at that stage of the tape and the whiteout. And I'm probably forgetting a couple of other things I did Yeah, um, to save having to retype something. And now, now I've, I've met an editor who said she thinks prose uh, declined. People have started writing much more poorly when the computer made it so easy to do insert passages. Mm -hmm. uh, that it led people, rather than concentrating and editing and cutting and sculpting their prose, led them to insert that every sentence got a little bloated. What do you think? So, in terms of that same process, what do you think? How do you think that affected poetry, and maybe yours specifically? Well, I think poetry uh, took an unproductive turn when people fell in love with the technology of the typewriter, and uh, Charles Olson wrote very solemnly about how the new poet, you count the spaces. <laughs> Proportional spacing came along within a decade or two yeah. and made nonsense of that. Uh, and uh, to me, the graphic thing, people talk about line endings quite a lot. Yeah. And I always feel, no, I don't write line endings, I write lines. Yeah. And it's the whole line. So that I guess you could say I'm kind of an extremist and uh, very resistant to the visual idea of the poem. Mm -hmm. And um, different technologies give people the illusion that poetry is a form of graphics. And I guess for them it is. Mm -hmm. For me, the unique quality of poetry is that it is vocal. It's on a human scale. Yeah. It comes out of one person's body, one syllable at a time. 
there's not you know, anybody else around. I'm not talking about poetry readings or performance. Right, right. I'm talking about things very similar to the favorite poem project videos. Yeah. So, um, technology, the most important thing yet to be done, it's amazing to me that hasn't been done yet. You know, poetry, I, I was a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and they brought to us very proudly for us chancellors to see somebody had made a program where the words of a poem can scroll and jump around. You see words do that on TV ads every day. It's, it's banal. Why don't they correct the fact that still, I think FSG won't publish poems in a, an electronic ebook edition because somehow nobody's come up with a way to preserve the integrity of the lines. Yeah. It seems to me that you could get a team of programmers could do that in a couple of days. I, I am also baffled by Probably going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. But at the moment, it's in this ridiculous stage where it hasn't happened. Yeah. On the other hand, Horace didn't have visual lines. True. They were just they didn't make spaces between the words. They wanted to save parchment or wax or papyrus or stone, whatever they were using. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just you could figure out where the lines were because the rhythms were so strong. Strong. Yeah. Um so for your own for your own work then, I mean like when did you how did I mean you have a very strong sense of poetry and, and you and like Jim and Michael sort of too and have that strong sort of oral sense of poetry and are, yes. and, are, and, are and are very dedicated to it. Do you think did that come out of working with uh, Winters? I mean, did that come out of, or did that come out of a kind of innate sense of what you were doing from the I beginning? Think, I think uh, there's some moment when I was reading how and sailing to Byzantium and Dickinson and I felt this reality in those things that was different from the reality of Alan's typewriter going staccato it was different from the reality of um, reading Ulysses hmm. or Dubliners yeah. that was a very powerful reality produced by those rectangular blocks of print and the pages, this was more physical in some way, more bodily, let's say. Yeah. So maybe made me ripe for winters, and he certainly amplified it by inviting me to learn something about George Gascoigne and Falk Greffel and Philip Sidney and yeah. Raleigh. Um, but I think it happened when I was in my late teens still. And, uh, you know, Ginsburg was obsessed by uh, blank verse, mm -hmm. by Eliot, and he gave himself these exercises in it. So it was, as is Williams in a completely different way, it was free verse that was intensely oral. Uh, Williams has all those poems called Metric Figure. And they're not obviously metric figures, but they're attempts to write intense rhythms that are not iambus, iambic or yeah. plain verse. Yeah, and that um, that move away from that, you know, is such a sort of interesting part of the century. But uh, okay, let me let me get back to these. I've gone a little bit further than. Um, So I guess, you know, I mean, the question, the kind of overarching question that I'm, I'm wondering is, you know, like as in, and as a digital librarian and as someone who's working in the digital yeah. and who, who has mostly, you know, who can't really remember ever not writing on a computer or not, you know, not yeah. using that. I mean, when that, when that, when that computer came in, when, you know, when the Atari came in and when the screen started appearing in front of you and the, and the ease of, of those deletions and, and insertions and rearrangements became possible. I mean, did, did that change the way you worked? Did that change what you produced? I don't think it changed what I produced, but I think that it was the beginning of a different kind of archival anxiety. Mm. There's the archival anxiety about paper works being preserved. Yeah. Um, Gibbon's manuscript or somebody else's manuscript being destroyed. Um, I'm of a generation where I save magazines that I have work in. Yeah. 
Uh, that's the old anxiety. And the new anxiety is the mortality of digital information. Yeah. I can remember the Librarian of Congress saying to me that the only way to preserve digital material is to reproduce it. Unlike papyrus, mm -hmm. it's mortal. It turns to mush. Yeah. That's aside from the fact that the medium keeps changing. Yeah. The favorite poem project videos today I talked about somebody who's going to take the original digital tapes and make them into current high definition format. Okay. Rather than the flash format they're in. They're in flash. Yeah, on the website. The okay. website will be enhanced. You'll be able to make them full screen. Okay. Well, I, for seven years, I was on the news hour with Jim Lehrer. Mm -hmm. When Frank Sinatra died, I read passages from Virgil about the death of a singer. When the stock market was in trouble, I read Frost's Provide, Provide. Uh -huh. um, at the time, the places I recorded those would give me dubs on VHS tape. Where are they? Where are the, where, where's that material? Yeah. It's a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, I'm anxious that it has gone into the ether. I was the poetry editor of Slate for many years. Mm -hmm. They eventually found poetry just not bringing enough hits, enough money, and add things. So they stopped doing it. To preserve it for a while, there were years when I would do a poem out of copyright. Classic poem. Do a poem yeah. by um, well, this is early how, Marianne Moore. It's how I was introduced to folk revival. So. Yeah. so I did those. I was shocked to learn, unlike almost everything, almost like all the kind of pornography and ads and stuff, they're gone. They're unretrievable. Hmm. Those discussions, and some, you know, well-known poets and critics took place in them and some yeah. took part in them, gone, vanished. So what, in what form were they written? They were in the fray, the discussion part. That is, oh. I was responding to people. Oh, the comment section below. Oh, yeah. So that something quite valuable that I put effort into yeah. vanished. Well, we all vanish. We all die. True. And most objects are destroyed. And we don't know how long Shakespeare's reputation will last. There's the large view. Yeah. But there's also the personal temporal anxiety. <laughs> and one has mixed emotions when, you know, my papers are at Stanford. They bought okay. up to a certain year of paper papers. Mm -hmm. And um, a librarian at Stanford said to me, I hope you're saving your email. I hope you're saving your electronic emails. And then there's a, a new anxiety there. Yeah. What in there that I wouldn't want? Quoted. Right, absolutely. Comes eternal. So there's the anxiety of what could be lost and the anxiety of what will be preserved. You don't want preserved. And there's the anxiety the family level is only a metaphor for the whole thing. And the photographs. I actually have some photographs of my great-grandparents' generation. Mm -hmm. Then there's the photographs of your grandparents' generation that you treasure. Yeah. We're producing... We all have a camera in our pocket. Right. It shoots video. Yes. <laughs> a little tiny sliver. It has access to almost all the information there is. And you can create more fourth-rate information with almost no effort at all. Selfie beep, beep. Beep. Yeah, yeah. If you want your grandchildren to pay any attention to your family photos, you better edit them. <laughs> because the future generation doesn't want to spend all day listening yeah. to grandpa say hiya. <laughs> so you better think about what time capsule you create. 
And as I say, that's only a metaphor for the larger question you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in one of my poems, in my poem called, I think it's in my poem, The Forgetting. Uh, Which I, book is that in? In golf music. In golf music. I say, uh, Ezra Pound praised the emperor, or the emperor who appointed a committee of scholars to choose the, I forget what it was, the thousand best no dramas and destroyed the others. Mm-hmm. For the good of the no, Ezra Pound approved of that, comma, the fascist. <laughs> I <can't remember> that. <laughs> so, I was trying to express ambivalence yeah. about the winnowing process and the selecting process. Now, the Library of Congress has to decide which sitcoms it will preserve, which commercials. Some of those commercials and sitcoms may be superior works of art to poetry by people who win the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. Who decides? Librarians. <laughs> somebody, somebody, somebody does. I guess you do. Like, I'm right here. <laughs> Just yeah. Talk to me. What do you need? Um, well, I mean, in, in terms of that winnowing process, then, like, what do you think about uh, your own kind of... I mean, I'm sure you have uncollected works and, and stuff like that. I mean, how do you feel towards those now? And, and where do you store those? I mean, what are they in paper in certain boxes? I mean, are they in the papers at the Stanford? The papers, every so often I accumulate enough, I ship them off to Palo Alto. Yeah. Um, electronically, I mean, uh, as it happens, in the last few months, uh, somebody... It happened twice that a poem of mine that I didn't choose to put in the selected mm. one was personal somebody said to me you know this poem of yours means a lot to me I remember the poem very well it's a poem called I think it's called The Reasons mm-hmm. and um, this person said it's a poem when I think about my ethnicity the way you deal with ethnicity it's very important to me and um Maybe I should have put it in the select and I didn't. Yeah. And then online, someone I've never met personally pointed to another poem. Because I published it in Poetry Magazine when I was in my 20s, uh, it is on the Poetry Magazine website. And she said how much she liked it. Yeah. I looked it up. I thought, pretty good. I never put it in any book. Oh, wow. I had forgotten it entirely. <laughs> Yeah. So, I don't know how that's germane to your questions, but it is germane. No, I think so. That there is no ultimate authority for that selection process. Yeah. The author included. Okay. Um, In terms of then, so, so, I'm trying to think how to segue this, but it's probably not going to segue very well, so let's ask. Uh, when you, so you, so you have these, you know, you've created the poem, you have it, I mean, well, here's, here's one way. Um, you have these digital files that contain the poem. Do you feel, and you've backed them up, and you, and you try to make sure that they're okay. I mean, do you feel some sort of, uh, I mean, the word I've used before here is like a dearness towards them, or do you feel that they're sort of just a, a means to something else somewhere else? A lot else? of it is mechanical. Yeah. A lot of it is unreflecting. I have many, many folders. I'm sort of a quasi-organized person. Okay. So under documents in my hard drive, which is then backed up in my backup drive, under documents, here comes Alan Pinsky home, uh, up the steps. In my documents, there are many, many folders. Letters spanning different years, prose. Medical. Hey, Alan Jane. Hi. Um, there's probably 30 of them. I haven't counted them. Okay. There's one called drafts. Yeah. In drafts under subfolders for most poems, there's that DR1, DR12, DR14. I look at it and I sometimes feel the way I have told you I feel about the family photographs. Yeah. Nobody wants all this. <laughs> Bishop yeah. has uh, Crusoe say about uh, the uh, umbrella that was so hard to make. Mm-hmm. The leather trousers gave them to the local museum. How can anybody want such things? I'm sure she's thinking about drafts and memorabilia yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Um, 
it's just another anxiety. I can't say I think about it a lot. No. But I'm ambivalent <laughs> when I think about all those megabytes <laughs> of drafts. Yeah. And two separate questions are, do I want anyone to look at them? And who could possibly want to look at them? But I don't destroy them. And I do somewhat mechanically shoot the dress at the dress. I guess part of the theory is I might want to look. Right. And I suppose once in many, many months I do look. And so you're saving each poem as a new draft. You don't like so you don't have it's not like one poem with many drafts in it. It's just each poem's a new a new file, a new draft. A new folder. No, each 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 poem for a poem, let's say the poem is called um, Mechanical Pencil. Uh-huh. Then it'll be uh, it'll have a name like Mech Pencil. Yeah. And with a uppercase M and P. And you have Ek, Mech Pencil dr1.x okay Mac pencil dr6.docx yeah Mac pencil 47 and maybe not every single one is saved not are okay and they all go into that folder okay and in the main file which is the, the next book book.pm whatever in that folder mm-hmm. uh, you have the separate points okay and then, have you been doing that your whole... When did you start using this sort of uh, folder system? I can't system? remember when I started doing it. But it's been but pretty probably consistent. Probably as soon as I started using the computer. Yeah. And, um, I mean, do you feel like you kind of envision the poems in that way? Like, using this... I mean, like, when you're kind of, like, thinking about them later, does that ever pop into your mind? Well, I think about the poem. I think about it... In my book or as part of my poetry reading, Mm -hmm. or if I'm in a particularly grandiose and hopeful state, I picture somebody reading it the way the people in the favorite poem project, you know, the way Seth Rodney reads Plath's Nick and the Candlestick. Yeah. Um, I was watching the the South Boston... Oh, the kid... uh, John... John... uh, uh, No, John... Ulrich. Yeah, John reads Gwendolyn Brooks, so we real cool. I really and I was all and I, and I was I was struck by how much I wanted to know how he's doing. You know, I was interested in him. Like, I mean, I you know the poem is great and everything, but it just made me like. Yeah. It, Last I heard, he was doing okay. I hope so. Good. Um, when you're when you so so I guess I'm a little unclear on to how like what your revision process is like. I mean, you you've I'm, I I think I have a sense of how the compositions happen. And then when you when you have say let's say most of the poem ready, I mean like when you're moving from draft you know yeah. O twenty to O twenty one, like what what are you doing in between there? Print out, right on the printout. Are you reading It'll, it out loud? See if you have the poem by memory. I might turn the light out and go to sleep. Try to recite the poem. If you come to a part you don't have, maybe that's the part you need to work on. Oh, okay. Not reliably, but sometimes. Yeah. And so, are, are you? Do you have like an intention in doing that? I mean, is it, is each poem different, or is there? Yeah, the intention is to make it worth somebody getting by heart, or wanting to read to their friend, or wanting to recite to themselves on a hike or when they're driving. Yeah. Do whatever it is that poems do. Right. So, so kind of realize that, yeah. that the poem is... What, what happens when a poem doesn't realize that? I mean, how do you know that a poem's not going to get there? In my case, <coughs> you keep working, and very rarely you abandon it. Usually some part of it that's worth it mm-hmm. gets incorporated into the next poem or into some future poem. Okay, so you kind of takes parts you, of Yes, around. you use it like the way Cubans do parts of sugar lace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, do other people have uh, work in this? Do other people kind of enter into this process? Yeah, I have friends. I mean, Louise sees what I write. Alan sees what I write. Um, maybe Gail Mazur. Um, different times in my life, there have been different friends. Mm-hmm. Or somebody around. Um, Jim, I'll sometimes email things to Jim. Yeah. And at what stage do these do the people usually come in? Fairly late. Fairly late. Yeah. To kind of get a reaction and yeah, something like that. Um, 
was the was working like on the translate was the translation work and using the computer and, and these sort of processes was it fundamentally different or what, did it share a similar? It was rather similar. Um, felt pen and I would print out the Italian and a trot of whatever canto I was working on. Mm -hmm. So two or three pieces of paper, maybe even one piece of paper, I had everything I needed. Yeah. And then it was uh, the metrical game. And you, you described that in, I think, I, what one of the interviews I've read is as sort of like like just an intensely pleasurable sort of work. I mean, like what, what kept drawing you back to it? It's why kids play video games. It's why guys play golf. <laughs> Uh, it's a difficulty that you become addicted to. You become entranced by the difficulty. People who need to do the New York Times crossword puzzle every day. Yeah. It's that part of the mind, the part of the mind that loves to solve difficulties. Or let's not say solve, engage a certain kind of difficulty. Mm -hmm. Because the video games often are infinite. True. You can't ever solve it. You can get better at it. Yeah. And making those um, tercets, those consonantal rhyme tercets and pentameters, and always compressing. I use fewer words in that translation than any other translation, <laughs> prose or verse. Mm -hmm. Always never, never pad to get a rhyme, compress to get a rhyme. That was the rule. Mm -hmm. And that became what a jigsaw puzzle is for somebody who loves jigsaw puzzles. What yeah. a video game is for somebody who loves video games. It became absorbing. Yeah. And so how, how long did that uh, project last? It was a year to get through the Inferno once and almost another year to re revise. Okay. And I, I read about, and then you worked on you worked on the revision with Frank Bedard, some yes. too. You put a lot of effort into that. Yeah. Um, and then, so I, so you have you have like the individual poems that you work on, and then so how does how do these poems then for you how do you how do you get them into a book? There's a folder called the there's book. a subfolder in the there's a folder called book.pms okay and it acquires a name when the book acquires a title mm -hmm. but it's the next book of poems and in that folder right now is a file called I think it's book 29 that is the 29th draft and I bothered to have a contents page yeah uh, which Nisus writer does very well <laughs> A contents page, page numbers, and an order the poems are in, mm -hmm. and that order will change. But it's what I have with me if I go somewhere to give a poetry reading. Okay. And um, it's a file. It's a fold. How I mean, how do you construct your orders? I guess it's different for each book. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how to answer. Yeah, I see it of your pants. It's see, it just intuitive. It's int intuitive. I mean, does it does it have some sort of uh, phrasing to it? I mean, is it musical in I that hope sense? Ideas and feelings get introduced. Yeah. I hope then they get developed and amplified and explained, and then I hope new elements come in in the course of that process. And at the same time, one recognizes that a goodly number of readers don't read the poems in order. Mm -hmm. Some people like to start in the middle, some people start at the end. But for those who want to see something in the order, um, golf music starts with a kind of peculiar title poem. Yeah. And it says this is not going to be easy, mm -hmm. and it's going to involve the newspaper and it's not going to take certain conventional roots for political poetry. Yeah. No, I was I, I found I found the order of the ordering and the construction of golf music to be very unusual. I mean, I was just sort of like extreme. I was thinking about it being just like unlike most things that come out now. I thought about it a lot. Yeah. I did want to make it something distinctive. Yeah. Um, and it starts with the most guzzle-like thing in the book. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so are you on draft 29 of the current book? Yes. <laughs> Is that where you're at? Okay. Yes. And do you have any idea when that's, that's just for me, but do you know when you're... Well, I'm on leave next year. Okay. I hope that before the year's over, I'll have the book. Um, how has teaching influenced the way you write? I mean, has it done much or has it sort of been the, the way that you support the time that you get to, to do the writing? It's not an easy question to answer. Yeah. Um, I'm proud of it as a profession. It's an honorable profession. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have probably helped more people than I've hurt people. And um, my students seem to be getting something out of what I do as a teacher. Um, I guess they help me. I ask them to make anthologies. So I guess among other things, they help me have a sense of what is currently esteemed. Yeah. Changes with frightening rapidity. <laughs> that every two or three years, the canon is very different. <laughs> has that has it gotten? Has that rate increased in in more recent years? Now that the internet has kind of made I'm things not more sure. available, could be. Or it could be just as I get older, I'm more disturbed by this, <laughs> uh, or delighted by it, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. But it certainly does suggest that the wheel of fashion uh, spins along pretty well. Yeah. Um, and then, I guess, you know, there's other questions about kind of your correspondence, and I know you, you talked about the anxiety of, of saving emails and stuff like that. I mean, but before, were you, did you, were you a big uh, physical letter I writer? Was, I used to write a lot of letters. Yeah. It used to be a way I would warm up. I remember when I was working on uh, the situation of poetry, mm -hmm. I would warm up. I had a routine where <clears throat> first I'd write a letter or two, mm -hmm. maybe three, and that would somehow make me feel I was working. Yeah than to glide into working on a poem or on that prose project it was somehow made easier and uh, I used to get a lot of letters and I used to send a lot of letters I still do once in a while yeah but electronic has has taken over when did that what, like what do you, can you point to a time when that's that sort of wave overtook I think in the late 80s early 90s okay people who you think wouldn't ever adapt to email adapted to email it became more and more of a lingua franca or a thing people had in common it became the agora yeah. it became where people met and um, the generation that only did paper correspondence got old and died <laughs> to be blunt about it yeah yeah um, do you find that there's a different is it a different genre? I mean, is it like, do you find that there's different, like, uh, interests? There are different, different conventions. Yeah. I must say that when I see letters I wrote long ago, I wince. I don't like it. Why Why? Why not? It's either naivete or there's falseness or there's clumsiness. Uh, to write a good letter in a way, you have to not think about how you're sounding or looking. Uh, it should be ephemeral. It should be at the moment. Yeah. And then to have it preserved for 20 years can be a little disturbing. Yeah. And you, do you think that there's more of an awareness of that with email? Like more of, more of a, like a... I think email is probably more unconscious. Okay. And I was joking with you about my friend who says scandalous things in emails. Yeah. I repeatedly tell him, look out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Things you read in the newspaper, where uh, some business setting or political setting, uh, people get nailed. Oh yeah, the email trail. Yeah, uh, it may be generational, maybe something that's changing. I think people say things in email they wouldn't say, quote, in writing, end quote, because they don't think of it as having as much permanence. Yeah, and sometimes it surprises them <laughs> oh, I think it surprised many prominent people um, my first job out of college was a paralegal and I just looked through emails after emails after emails for yeah. hot docs as I was told I, yeah and hitting delete 
doesn't doesn't do it. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't shred it. No. <laughs> um, so kind of a you know more overall. I mean, do you think? The advent of the kind of computer and the rise of the computer in your sort of practice has changed things fundamentally, or you, like, what? What if the computer had never really? What if you were still with working with your IBM? Publication is different. Publication. I mean, we've been talking about production. Yeah. And production's changed somewhat. Yeah. For me, probably not as much as many people. Partly because I've been doing it so long with the computer. Right. And because poetry for me is vocal. Publication mm-hmm. is in the midst of some kind of tremendous transition. Yeah. And I don't think anybody knows where it's going exactly. But I recently spent a few days in New York. It's pleasing to see the people with a book in the subway, a magazine, or a newspaper. Yeah. But most people who are looking at something are looking at a screen. Yeah. I'm surprised how many are looking at uh, tablets. Yeah. Lots are looking at phones. And a certain number are playing games. A certain number are checking their email. Uh, a certain number are listening to music and looking at something that goes with the music. How many are reading? I don't know. Yeah. But at the moment... If a magazine tells you they want to put something in their web page rather than in print, you feel, well, it's their second level of affection for this. That may be shifting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I wonder about that, too. I feel like yeah. it's, it's right on that cusp. I think it's all, it's all very fluent. And mm-hmm. We don't know. And I don't think anybody really is quite sure what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, I guess... One has to not think about it too much. Yeah, I mean, unless you have to make those decisions, right? And it is, I mean, the, the, your point about the formatting and, and, and about them not figuring that out yet. That, it's, that's going to happen soon. Yeah, but I mean, it, even in, you know, even in HTML, I mean, you know, even if you see your poems get put up there, there's so many, I just see so many, like, prop, like, I mean, it's just easy cha- easy problems that people yeah. just don't know because there's so many different levels of expertise. It used to drive me crazy and slate when a, an ad would disrupt a poem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and just kind of, like, like break a line in a weird yeah. way or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Some Maybe a famous poem. Yeah. yeah. Um, not, you know. Um, Are we almost done? Yes. I'm getting a little worn out. I think we're done. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Robert. That was great. That was fun. It's a smart thing to be going into. We'll see. (laughs) We'll see.